welcome everyone. Um, excited to be here today to talk to you. My name's Nicholas Scholars. I'm a licensed psychologist in the state of Utah. Um, and today, uh, my hope is that we can discuss how therapists um, can develop a toolkit for recognizing dementia uh, in our clients, and then also um, some interventions we can use uh, to support them as they move through. Um, so just a little bit uh, about myself. Um, I am a licensed psychologist in Utah, as I said, and I received my training in Newburgh, Oregon at George Fox University. Um, I've been interested in neuropsych topics for quite a while now. Um, I've taken uh, extra training in behavioral and cognitive neurology, as well as um, uh, clinical neuroanatomy. So um, I'll be drawing off of that today as well. So just before we get started, um, I just want to um, talk to you guys about how important it is for us to be accurate um, in our uh, assessment of clients. Um, we do run the risk of misdiagnosing our clients and giving them the wrong treatment if we misuse this information. And we don't want any of those negative outcomes for our clients or increased liability for us. Um, so uh, I'm really going to focus on screening for dementia and the purpose of continuation of care uh, in order to prevent against this. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest uh, to declare. Um, I'm not receiving any commercial support uh, from, from this presentation. So um, there's nothing to worry about there. Um, so with those things, we'll just jump right into the material. Um, and uh, my hope is that as we uh, go forward uh, in today's uh, presentation that if you have a question uh, that you want answered, feel free to just type it in the chat and I can answer um, as time goes on. Um, and I think that'll be a lot easier um, and be more I don't know, integrated with the presentation. So um, I want to start out with talking about why this is important. Um, obviously, the population of older adults is quite large, uh, so all of us are likely to encounter clients in the future who fit this demographic, um, unless we are, you know, focusing on a different one, like children, um, although uh, my doubt is that we have very many child-focused psychologists here. Um, I might be wrong about that psychologists or therapists. So um, it used to be the case with dementia that detecting dementia early simply meant that the client got to know earlier <laughs> that they were experiencing signs of dementia. Um, however, since dementia in most cases uh, was and still is incurable, um, finding out early did not really alter the course of the disease. Um, now, though, and this is only true in the last three or four years, um, early detection has become more important than ever before. Uh, this is because we have several new medications that are either FDA approved or in the process of getting FDA approved um, that alter the course of the disease. Um, and this offers a lot of hope for people who are um, in the beginnings of experiencing uh, signs and symptoms of dementia. So uh, some of the drugs that are now on the market can really meaningfully extend a person's lifespan, not just the time spent alive, um, but uh, the time that they have to maintain their independence. Um, and so, um, at this point, 
we can extend that period of time um, by about two to three years, um, which in the grand scheme of things may not seem like a lot, but if those two to three years are time spent with family and maintaining independence and um, slowing down the progression of the disease, that can um, be extremely meaningful for our clients. Um, hopefully as these drugs get even better, uh, we might be able to extend it for quite a long time. Um, of course, those drugs that I'm talking about primarily affect um, uh, Alzheimer's disease specifically. Um, they target those amyloid proteins that are known to accumulate on brain tissue uh, and cause Alzheimer's. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on today. Um, but there are also other types of dementia um, that could possibly be completely avoided if we're aware of the symptoms and the risk factors. So a good example of this would be vascular dementia. Uh, in many cases, this could be completely avoided uh, if we avoid cardiovascular events like strokes, um, or if we're aware of them um, and are able to seek care right after they happen, we can at the very least um, avoid um, compounding uh, dysfunction. So, uh, but this requires both clients and therapists to be aware of those preventative measures and the steps that can be taken to maximize those chances that uh, cardiovascular events do not happen. Um, however, in order to do that, we need to know those early signs. So uh, one difficulty with the early signs of dementia is that they can present as mood-related disorders or psychosis quite often. Um, and this means that we're at risk of misdiagnosing our clients and spending valuable lengths of time treating the wrong thing. Um, and with dementia, Time is a very valuable um, thing, and we don't want to waste it. Um, so being able to discern dementia and then get them into the pipeline of dementia care as quickly as possible is very important. Um, and so if we can detect them earlier, uh, we can get them in earlier. Um, and just by nature of the job of psychotherapy, where we're seeing our clients routinely, um, often for uh, several months or even years at a time, um, we're in a very unique position to be able to spot those early signs and symptoms and notice their development, maybe more so than other providers. Not because those providers don't want to, um, but our clients just don't see those providers as often. So we're in a really advantageous position to be able to spot these things. Um, and not only can early detection and prevention um, elongate a person's life, but it can also allow their caregivers and their support systems more time to make adjustments um, when um, they are preparing to become caregivers. And so those are just some reasons why this is especially important in uh, this time of history. <laughs> Uh, so now I want to go through what we're going to talk about today. Um, the first thing I want to do is to talk to you about the definition of dementia. So most people think they know what dementia means. And usually what they're referring to when they say dementia is the type of dementia that we see in Alzheimer's disease. Um, but dementia is actually uh, much more heterogeneous than that. Um, Alzheimer's is only one kind of dementia. So what I wanna uh, tell you today is the definition of dementia broadly speaking, and then move through some of the main types of dementia and talk about how they're different from each other. Um, this is going to involve knowing the warning signs and associated features of the different types of these dementias. And the after that, I want to talk to you about what types of referrals will be appropriate should you begin to notice signs of dementia in your clients. Um, if you don't know already, providing dementia care will always be an interprofessional collaboration. Um, 
we as therapists are going to be on the front lines of dementia screening, uh, and that's super important. However, some of the most powerful treatments are only provided by other types of providers. For example, the drugs that I was talking about are going to require a physician um, since at present they usually require uh, intravenous um, administration. So um, unless you have gotten some type of IV training in the past and are cleared by the state, um, you're going to need a physician. Um, and I think that's probably most of us who are here today. Certainly not me. Um, so um, knowing the appropriate referrals and how to move your clients through the referral pipeline is extremely important uh, for getting them the care that they need for as fast as possible. Um, part of that process, though, of detecting the early signs of dementia is going to require that you screen your clients when you suspect that they have dementia. So um, I also want to give you some screening tools out there that can be used. And I won't have time to get through all of them. There are a lot out there and there's a lot of really good ones. But what I will do is provide you with three common screening tools that you can use to detect the early signs of dementia. Um, I've aimed for providing you uh, with free tools that you can download off the internet. Two of them don't require any training at all. Um, obviously look them over before you give them, but uh, they can be given with by anyone with a master's degree or above. The other one uh, does require a little bit of training, um, but it's very short um, and it's also uh, one of the most common screening tools out there. So in terms of having kind of a common language to communicate with doctors, uh, it can be really useful. Um, after that, uh, it can be really important for clients to kind of know what they're going into. So I want to talk about common diagnostic uh, processes that often happen when they are referred to these providers. Um, it can be helpful for them to know in order to prepare them. Um, and it can also be helpful in combating misinformation about dementia and dementia care. Um, because often clients who are misinformed about what uh, dementia testing involves, uh, they may avoid seeking care because they don't have all the facts. So being able to provide them with those facts is pretty crucial. Um, and then I'm also gonna talk to you about treatment disparities and cross-cultural considerations. So while treatment uh, disparities exist in all corners of the healthcare system, they are especially prominent in the area of dementia care. So uh, by knowing some of the history of the healthcare system and how it has come to be the way that it is, gives us important context, um, which will be helpful as we interact with clients who are already uh, maybe more aware than we are. So kind of getting on the same page as them can be helpful in maintaining that therapeutic alliance. Um, and it can also maximize both you and your clients' chances of either avoiding or overcoming those obstacles um, that have been placed uh, by societal power structures to prevent them from getting the care that they need. Um, and then for these last two bullet points, during the sign-up process for this presentation, we also received some questions about what might be helpful to cover. Uh, and so I want to tackle those as I think that both of them are extremely important questions. So uh, the first one is talking about early onset versus late onset dementia. Um, and as research on dementia has accumulated, this idea of early onset versus late onset dementia has become uh, pretty prominent and widespread. It's been featured in the media. So if you've ever seen the movie called Still Alice, it has Alec Baldwin and Julianne Moore. Um, that is a case of early onset dementia. Um, it, it's a sad movie. I wouldn't recommend that you watch it if you're looking for something uplifting, um, but it is also um, a good um, uh, movie to watch if you're wanting to know kind of what it is like for a, th a family to move through um, a case of early onset dementia. 
Um, and then the last thing that we'll talk about is how to talk about clients or how to talk to clients uh, about seeking care um, if they are uh, resistant or fearful of going in. So um, this can be a tough spot to be in um, since many clients may state that they prefer not to know. Um, others may prefer not to know, but at a less conscious level. So they may be in denial. Um, sometimes the refusal to go can even be a symptom of dementia itself if the symptoms are progressed enough. Um, and uh, knowing how to connect your clients with resources and their social network can be helpful in motivating them to seek care. So, uh, and still other times there's external obstacles. So I want to tackle some of those too. So to start off, then I'll tell you about the definition of dementia. And I took this straight from the Alzheimer's Association. Um, dementia is a general term for any loss of memory, language, problem solving, uh, or other thinking abilities that are severe enough to interfere with daily life. Um, Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia. So I think that's one thing that I want to say from the get-go that'll make the rest of what I'm going to say uh, maybe more understandable, which is that dementia is a symptom. It's not a disorder. So I think a good analogy for this um, would be the analogy from medicine, which is nasal congestion or fever. Um, there are a lot of different medical disorders that will result in nasal congestion or fever. Some of them are viruses, uh, others are bacteria, um, it can be a whole slew of other things. Um, these things, nasal congestion and fever, are names to describe an experience and not a disease. And the same thing is true for dementia. There are lots of different diagnoses that will have dementia as a symptom. Um, so just be aware of that. As therapists in the United States, we use the DSM-5. We now have the DSM-5-TR as of this past year. This is what we use to evaluate uh, people for dementia. And in the DSM, uh, they do not really use the term dementia all that often, actually. Um, it actually uses the term neurocognitive disorder. Um, but the term neurocognitive disorder uh, is explaining those same problems with uh, memory, language, problem solving, and executive function. So um, these are uh, kind of, at least today, dementia and neurocognitive disorder, I'm going to use them interchangeably. Um, the DSM goes further on to talk about the difference between major neurocognitive disorder and mild neurocognitive disorder. Uh, major neurocognitive disorder uh, describes what happens when we encounter a person um, who has signs of dementia um, that are severe enough to cause functional impairment. Um, so uh, functional impairment usually begins to occur uh, when people have trouble managing their finances, uh, when people have trouble maintaining their personal hygiene, um, being out alone without getting lost. These are major impairments in our ability to function. Um, mild neurocognitive disorder um, is uh, basically when we have problems in you know, memory, language, problem solving, but they are not severe enough to cause um, a functional impairment. So uh, Another term to just make this more confusing is that mild neurocognitive disorder uh, is often used interchangeably with the term mild cognitive impairment. So mild cognitive impairment is essentially mild neurocognitive disorder without specification of a cause. So uh, mild dementia is another way we might describe it. Um, in most cases, mild cognitive impairment um, can be evidence of what will eventually progress to be major neurocognitive disorder uh, due to some cause. Not all the time, um, but this can uh, often be the case, especially with older adults. 
Um, so that's a little bit about dementia. The next thing um, is, and this is more just a preview of what I'll talk about here in a second, is that there are multiple causes of dementia in the DSM-5. This list is not exhaustive, um, but I've tried to cover some of the, the more common ones. Um, we have Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, uh, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, traumatic brain injury, and HIV are all things that can cause different types of dementia. Um, so I'll get started with Alzheimer's disease. I think it would be best to start out with the most common type of dementia, um, which is probably the one that most of us have heard of. Uh, this type of dementia is known as Alzheimer's disease. Um, according to the DSM, approximately 60 to 90% of all neurocognitive disorder diagnoses each year are going to be due to Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it's quite common um, amongst uh, dementia diagnoses. In terms of the general population, five to 10% of all adults in their 70s um, are gonna begin to show signs of Alzheimer's disease. And then for each decade onward, people in their 80s and 90s, 25% will show uh, signs of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it's pretty common. Um, it's characterized by what we call an insidious onset. That's a quote from the DSM. Um, in other words, it's slow and it's gradual. Uh, the reason for this is that Alzheimer's disease is caused by the buildup of amyloid proteins on the brain tissue over time, uh, as well as to the damage that that, um, that those proteins cause uh, to the brain tissue itself. Um, so Alzheimer's disease has been more common as human lifespans have gotten longer. When the average human lifespan was somewhere between 30 and 50, most people were dying of diseases, things like cholera um, or smallpox uh, and some of the things that um, have kind of, at least um, in the West, have become less prominent. Um, medical advances can now prevent a lot of those dangerous diseases or, or treat them and alleviate them before they kill people. So people are now living into their 70s, 80s, and 90s um, a lot more often. Um, so in many ways, we can wonder if Alzheimer's disease is simply what happens to the brain as the brain gets older. Um, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to cure it or avoid it, and there are ways to do that. Um, but in many ways, Alzheimer's is a sign of old age in and of itself. Um, and so um, you kind of just want to be aware of that. The typical presentation for Alzheimer's disease is what is called the amnestic type. Um, it is an impairment in memory and learning. Um, and this is the classic type of dementia that most people think about when they hear the word dementia. So the first signs usually become apparent when people have difficulty learning new information. And the learning is, it's not just problems learning new skills or new facts. The problem can be in learning names, um, the date of each day, um, and uh, like the location of your house. So obviously the impairment in memory is also quite striking as the disease progresses. Um, People may begin to forget what they did yesterday. They may, uh, in the very late stages, even begin to forget people whom they've known for a very long time, like their spouses, their children, their grandchildren. All of these stereotypical symptoms of dementia are, they fall into the category of what we would call the amnestic type. Um, and you can see it comes from the same root word as amnesia. Um, when we diagnose Alzheimer's disease, usually we will put a specifier of either probable or possible Alzheimer's disease. Um, 
The reason for this is that the only way we can diagnose Alzheimer's disease is uh, that um, through autopsy. We need to do an autopsy to really figure it out. Um, and in cases where the patient is still living, that is not possible. So um, there's always going to be a certain measure of uncertainty um, to diagnosis um, when we're doing Alzheimer's disease. Um, as we get better technology, I think um, hopefully we can become more certain. So when we use the specifier of probable, um, we are using it because we have some causative evidence of Alzheimer's disease. So the two most important uh, or uh, most common types of causative evidence is a family history of Alzheimer's and the detection of biomarkers. So genetic studies have shown that Alzheimer's disease travels in families. So we know that if a client has a close family member um, who has passed away from Alzheimer's, then that increases their chances of their dementia also being caused by Alzheimer's disease as well. Um, another strong indicator is the presence of biomarkers. I've already mentioned that these amyloid proteins that build up on the brain uh, can often be detected through cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. Um, and doctors will often take a sample of CSF and test it for the presence of these amyloid proteins. Um, the amyloid proteins occur naturally in the body. So the test really, uh, rather than looking for the presence of them, it's looking for an average, uh, like a higher than average concentration. Um, so uh, I'm looking at the question in the chat in terms of, uh, looks like someone's asked the question, is amyloid buildup also called white matter? Um, so it would actually be a, a bit different. Amyloid proteins um, are um, proteins that build up on top of things like white matter and gray matter. Um, so white matter and gray matter are the two types of matter that composes uh, the brain tissue itself. Um, and so um, I'll get to the amyloid proteins here just in a second. Um, so they do occur though in the CSF. Um, we use the specifier of possible Alzheimer's disease when evidence of biomarkers or family history is either not detectable or unavailable. So um, because of Alzheimer's uh, characteristic symptoms, we may suspect uh, that Alzheimer's is the cause, but if people's family members have uh, passed away or they're not in contact with family members, or if there is no tests that have been done for biomarkers, we might say possible Alzheimer's rather than probable. Um, the hope being that uh, the person will go on to get additional testing um, and be able to, um, you know, increase their certainty. Um, so I've kind of already been through some of this um, in terms of diagnosis. Yeah, there's no way to diagnose Alzheimer's disease without an autopsy. Um, you have to actually cut into the brain to see the damage um, before you can diagnose Alzheimer's disease with any level of certainty. But since we figured out those biomarkers, um, we've gotten a lot better um, at figuring out what the possible cause is. Um, if you refer your client to a doctor, um, they'll usually do a physical and neurological exam. Um, that doesn't necessarily directly test for Alzheimer's, but it's standard of care. Um, they may use diagnostic imaging. They may analyze cerebrospinal fluid that is done via a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap. Um, and then also cognitive testing, which is often done by a psychologist. Um, the next type of dementia 
is called frontotemporal dementia or FTD. So um, once again, it's characterized by that slow uh, and gradual um, insidious onset. So, so far we've discovered two variants or manifestations of FTD. The first one is the behavioral variant. So for indi individuals who have the behavioral variant of FTD, usually their loved ones will begin to notice a new level of apathy in their behavior. And this can often present as depression. So someone with FTD may come to therapy asking for treatment for depression. Um, uh, in reality, they are beginning to experience dementia. Um, in addition to the apathy, however, family members can also begin to report new levels of behavioral disinhibition. Um, personality changes are often quite striking. Um, so people will begin to lose their ability to sympathize or empathize uh, with other people. And this can be especially heartbreaking for family members when someone who was formerly uh, or formerly a really empathic and warm person becomes really cold and unempathic. Um, obsessive and compulsive behaviors can also become quite prominent. So sometimes people with the behavioral variant uh, will come to therapy uh, reporting the new onset of OCD behaviors um, when in reality, um, they're experiencing dementia. Um, Hyperorality, um, which is a preoccupation with putting things in your mouth, um, can be a symptom, as well as dietary and appetite changes. Um, as a result of all of these things, uh, socialization becomes uh, really difficult. Again, people can become uh, colloquially what we would call mean. Um, or inappropriate in the things that they say. Um, they can have difficulty with uh, executive abilities like paying attention or doing uh, complex tasks. Um, and this can be uh, really difficult for family members um, who uh, are experiencing this. The, the reason for these symptoms uh, is largely due to atrophy in the frontal lobes of the brain. So. Um, these are the parts of the brain that deal with behavioral inhibition, uh, motivation, um, social cognition. So when that part starts to atrophy, it would make sense that we would lose the ability to uh, perform those functions. The second variant of FTD is called the language variant. Um, people are going to see a decline in language ability, much more so than um, social ability. So um, this is due to the temporal lobes being the ones that are atrophying rather than the frontal lobes. Uh, the temporal lobes, especially on the left side, have a lot to do with um, speech production and uh, word comprehension. So um, as these symptoms progress, um, people will often notice a prominent decline in their language ability. So their sentences may become shorter. Um, they evidence a slower rate of speech um, and it could possibly become slurred. Um, they'll often have trouble with word finding. So an example of this is someone who would say like, oh, uh, yesterday we went to the, what's it called? the store. <laughs> so it may take them a long time to recall the word, or they may not be able to recall it at all. So they'll do something that we call circumlocution, um, which is uh, using multiple words essentially to describe one word. So the place where we get the food um, would be a way of discussing a grocery store um, via circumlocution. Um, they may also have trouble with naming objects. So if you point to an object like a pencil, um, they may have trouble remembering the word. They'll still remember what, like how to use it, um, but they may not remember the word, or it may take them an abnormally long time to recall what it's called. 
Um, another thing that can happen is that people may remember the category that a certain object falls in, um, but they may not um, remember which word within the category uh, is the correct one. So they may call a spoon a fork. Uh, both of both spoons and forks fall into the category of silverware. They may still uh, remember how to use a spoon and a fork, but when it comes to finding the correct word and matching it, uh, they may have a lot of difficulty doing that. Um, people may often have trouble with grammar. So in mental status examinations, we often ask people to repeat the phrase, no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, and this is because uh, these, type, these articles of speech are often the first to go um, when uh, we are losing our language ability. Um, they're also the last to arrive for children. So in a way, this is a regression of speech. Um, and then finally, word comprehension. So them understanding what you say um, is going to become very difficult. Um, they may not be able to follow um, requests or commands or directions very well, not because they can't hear you uh, audibly, um, but the words you're saying are beginning to lose their meaning. Um, one way that frontotemporal dementia is different is that learning and memory are typically spared. So the typical onset, uh, or yeah, the typical onset is different from Alzheimer's. People will still remember their past. They'll still remember um, the people in their life. They won't get lost as often. Um, because these are not the parts of the brain uh, that are atrophying. With Alzheimer's disease, it's the hippocampus, and that's why we forget stuff uh, when we have Alzheimer's. For frontotemporal, uh, those, those things are usually spared until right at the end. Um, FTD also has a typical onset that is a lot earlier than Alzheimer's disease, so it usually occurs in the fifth or sixth decade of life. However, it's been known to set on um, as early as the third decade of life and as late as the ninth decade of life. Um, so um, this is one of the things, and we'll talk about this later, one of the things that uh, we talk about when we talk about early onset um, uh, dementia. So um, and this is why FTD can often go undiagnosed because it masquerades as other things, things like depression, OCD, and even personality disorders. So we begin to see the importance of a really thorough history um, that in many ways is likely to be more helpful for diagnosis than any sort of test we could give. Um, again, it's usually diagnosed with Imaging, things like PET scans or CT scans. Um, we know some of the genes that tend to be associated with uh, FTD, so we can test for those. And then about 40% of new FTD cases have a close family relationship to someone who has died of FTD. So getting uh, a family history uh, is really important. Um, FTD also progresses a lot faster than Alzheimer's disease. So um, we may be familiar with people in our life who receive an Alzheimer's disease uh, diagnosis and they live 10 to 15 more years as they slowly um, begin to decline. For FTD, the time between diagnosis and death tends to be six to eight years. So it's a lot quicker. Um, the next type of dementia is Lewy body dementia, um, and it holds the theme here with an insidious onset and gradual um, progression. One of the first symptoms, though, is going to be fluctuations in cognition and alertness. So people may have periods where they're very confused, they may appear very sleepy, um, and this may last for a short period of time before they kind of magically regain their uh, composure as if nothing ever happened. Um, another symptom is very well-formed and detailed visual hallucinations. 
So this stands in a pretty stark contrast, actually, with schizophrenia. Um, uh, psychosis in schizophrenia tends to be predominantly auditory. Um, there are visual hallucinations, but um, they don't tend to be as detailed. So with schizophrenia, they may see um, the walls kind of moving in, in wavy ways. Um, and uh, with uh, uh, Lewy body disease, people can see full body apparitions, um, essentially, and it can be quite scary for them and quite heartbreaking for people to observe that. Um, another symptom is the spontaneous uh, onset of Parkinson's symptoms. So with actual Parkinson's disease, um, the onset also tends to be pretty gradual. Um, with uh, Lewy body dementia, it can be quite rapid and often in conjunction with other forms of cognitive decline. Um, and so uh, in a lot of ways, though, you'll begin to see that Lewy body dementia um, does mimic Parkinson's in some important ways, which can make it hard to uh, differentiate. Um, with Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's, people may meet criteria for REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, and this is often described by people who have it as incredibly vivid dreams. So to use the example of my own grandfather who passed away from Parkinson's dementia, um, had REM sleep behavior disorder, he described it um, as uh, very vivid dreams of being attacked by tigers. Um, and he would shout and talk and thrash in his sleep um, as a result. Um, people will act out their dreams, so they may sleepwalk, essentially. And this can be especially dangerous if the person is an older adult who's a fall risk. Um, and uh, getting another question here on any thoughts on musical ear syndrome um, and whether or not it goes along with uh, dementia diagnosis. Um, I'm actually not familiar with musical ear syndrome. So um, I don't know if I can be helpful in that <laughs> respect. Um, I will have to research it, research it after. Um, so um, another thing that happens uh, with Lewy body dementia is a severe sensitivity to anti-psychotic anti medication. So um, often with psychosis and Parkinson's, some of the treatments are antipsychotic medications. So often doctors will prescribe those with the intent to treat those symptoms. And what we'll see is an extreme sensitivity that often manifests um, as things like uh, tardive dyskinesia, which can also occur at higher levels of medication in folks with actual Parkinson's. So if you're not familiar with what tardive dyskinesia is, um, it's basically a motor disorder that happens uh, when we uh, are having a reaction to antipsychotic medication. Um, oftentimes people can begin to jerk, put their arms up. Um, oftentimes their mouth, they may begin to stick their tongue out. Um, and these are all things um, that uh, people with Lewy body dementia have a lot lower threshold for. Um, so uh, there are other associated features with Lewy body dementia. Um, the fluctuations in alertness that we talked about often take uh, the form of repeated falls, syncope. Syncope is fainting, essentially, and other unexplained losses of con uh, consciousness. Um, urinary incontinence is quite common. And while uh, visual hallucinations are prominent, auditory hallucinations can also be um, uh, a feature. So it's not either or uh, between schizophrenia and, and Lewy body dementia. Um, Another thing that is common is highly systematized, uh, highly developed, intricate delusions. Um, so 
um, to go back to the example of my grandfather, um, he uh, developed a delusion that the United States was going to be invaded by another country. So he began to stack sandbags on the inside walls of his house um, with the assumption that he was going to be in a firefight. Um, thankfully, he did not have a gun, um, but he somehow was going to be engaged in a firefight and he needed sandbags for it. Um, so um, his delusion was very intricate. He had, he could talk for hours about the politics of this imaginary situation, when it was going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is different from the types of delusions that we see in people with um, uh, other types of psychosis like mania or uh, schizophrenia. Those individuals tend to have trouble just by nature of their symptoms maintaining a train of thought. Um, and so when, uh, if you were to ask them to elaborate on their delusions, they tend to be disjointed, not they're loosely associated. Um, they may not have be able to articulate why they have these delusions at all. And this is very different for folks with Lewy body dementia who can do that. Um, another type of delusional uh, symptom is delusional misidentification is quite common. So um, this can take two forms. The first one is someone who uh, mistakes another person for their uh, someone who's familiar to them. So I once had a client who was in her 70s, um, and anytime she saw a woman, any woman, she would say, that's my daughter. Um, and um, she was convinced that, that that woman was her daughter. Um, and uh, with uh, uh, the alternative way would be uh, what we call Capgras syndrome. Um, Capgras syndrome is a delusional belief that someone who is familiar to you um, is an imposter um, in disguise. Um, and this can be quite terrifying since um, if this were true, um, all of us would start to feel quite paranoid as to why this was happening. So uh, it can be very uh, distressing. Um, it looks like we have a question about prescribing an antipsychotic and whether it's dangerous if someone has Lewy body dementia. Um, yeah, when it, when talking about antipsychotics, I, I kind of bump up against um, my professional competency. <laughs> um, but what I do know is that, because uh, I don't prescribe, um, but what I do know is that when uh, folks have tardive dyskinesia on inpatient units, um, it's usually the psychiatrist is uh, called to rapidly issue another medication to alleviate those effects. Um, so having uh, tardive dyskinesia or these reactions to antipsychotics um, is not something we want happening um, for a very long period of time. Um, due to Lewy bodies, not uh, you can't remove them from, they're, they're similar to amyloid proteins. They, they're substances that accumulate on brain tissue. They can't be removed. Um, so uh, this is an educated guess, but my guess would be that antipsychotics are not all that helpful uh, in treating it, um, unlike uh, what we know about Parkinson's. Um, so yeah, that's the, the best I can do for that question. Um, with uh, And also depression um, is a common symptom of Lewy body dementia. So again, people in the early stages may come to therapy uh, talking about symptoms of depression. Prevalence in terms of new neurocognitive disorder cases tends to be 1.7% to 30.5%. So the DSM does not really do a good job of telling us um, how often it occurs, because that is quite a large range. Um, the, the next type of dementia is vascular dementia. Um, this is the second most common type of dementia uh, that we see. Um, it's different from the other types. 
um, because usually the onset is relatively rapid. And this is because it's directly correlated with brain damage that happens as the result of a cardiovascular event. So common causes of uh, cardiovascular events um, are strokes. And this can be a large vessel stroke or microvascular strokes, um, an aneurysm that essentially ruptures. Um, you know, if that does not kill the person outright um, and they're able to get to the, uh, the hospital, they may have lasting uh, brain damage that causes dementia. And then any sort of prolonged loss of oxygen, which is technically what a stroke is, um, can injure the brain. So for example, people who have had near drowning incidents, um, people who've been in heart failure, cardiac arrest for long periods of time uh, before being resuscitated can also um, suffer vascular damage. So uh, 20 to 30% of all stroke victims will eventually be diagnosed with vascular dementia. Um, and the type of impairment that comes along with vascular dementia um, is pretty heterogeneous because it depends on where the brain damage occurs. Um, often though with vascular dementia, rather than a slow and gradual decline, you'll see a rapid onset and then a stepwise decline where people will have a decline and then the that will hold steady for sometimes quite a long time before having another rapid drop. So that's another way to kind of differentiate the two. Um, traumatic brain injury is another way that people can acquire dementia. And this really gets at how broad dementia can be because um, while people can have Alzheimer's-like symptoms as a result of traumatic brain injury, most types of uh, TBI have other types of uh, cognitive impairment. So, um, uh, but the main thing is that the onset of symptoms happens after a TBI. So um, different types of TBI, or, or sorry, signs of a TBI include any loss of consciousness, um, post-trauma amnesia, forgetting uh, details about the how you hit your head, confusion, any sort of neurological signs like seizures, visual field cuts where you neglect part of your visual field, uh, paralysis, even if it's temporary, um, and a loss of a sense of smell. Um, so um, it used to be the case that we thought of uh, concussions as minor forms of TBI that <clears throat> may not have a lot of consequences at all. Um, but we're actually seeing that that's not true. There's actually a very low correspondence between the severity of the TBI and the level of functional impairment that comes after. Um, so one thing that's getting a lot of research now is uh, what's called post-concussion syndrome, which is essentially problems in uh, thinking, memory, problem solving that come as a result of a concussion. Um, the risk factors for high levels of functional impairment after a TBI uh, tend to be uh, little to no healing precautions taken post-trauma. So uh, I won't go through them here, but if you go to the Center for Disease Control website, you'll see that there are um, uh, guidelines that they have for how you should rest after a TBI and how you should gradually add in activity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those are incredibly important um, because uh, they ensure that your brain heals afterward. Excuse me. Um, another type of risk factor is advanced age. This is going to uh, make the brain uh, more fragile, um, just like many parts of our body. So having an advanced age in a traumatic brain injury can predict um, higher levels of functional impairment. A history of former concussions can also predict higher levels of functional impairment. So someone who has had three concussions already and then incurs a fourth one, even if it's minor, can experience high levels of functional impairment. 
Um, TBIs can also stack, meaning if you haven't completely healed from the first uh, concussion and you incur another concussion, even if that second one is minor, um, it will basically compound on top of the first one. Um, and so this is why uh, concussions in the context of contact sports have become such a hot button issue because we're sending people who've just incurred concussions back in sometimes within the same game. Um, but given the length of a football season, it may not be possible to um, heal from a first concussion within the same amount of time as the football season. So um, that's why it's a hot button issue. Uh, and then lastly, substance use um, can be um, something that prevents healing of the brain tissue. Um, another type of uh, dementia is actually caused by HIV. Um, since HIV is a virus, um, oftentimes it will spread to the brain um, and cause swelling of the brain. We call this encephalitis. So your brain is growing in size and it's starting to press up against your cranium or your skull um, and uh, that can harm brain tissue. Um, <clears throat> once again, um, this can present differently from the traditional uh, Alzheimer's disease. Usually executive functioning and processing speed um, are some of the first things to go. Um, problems with uh, word fluency, so, so speaking in fluid sentences can be difficult. Um, because of these things, learning new information is hard. Uh, if you can't pay attention, if you can't process information, it's very difficult for, uh, for you to be um, learning new information. Um, so this may make it so it's hard for them to form new memories but autobiographical memory is usually spared. So you don't see as much forgetting of loved ones um, uh, or of old memories. Um, we know that 25% of people diagnosed with HIV will progress to mild neurocognitive disorder or mild cognitive impairment. Again, these will be noticeable and measurable cognitive impairments, but their independence, their functional, or their daily functioning, sorry, uh, will not be impacted, or if it is, it's impacted very little. 5% um, will progress to major neurocognitive disorder. Hopefully some of this will begin to um, uh, decrease uh, now that we have um, better medications to both prevent and um, in some cases halt the progression of HIV. So these are, I've, I've kind of gone through the major types of HIV. Now I wanna move into how we can screen for them. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna start with is the MOCA. Um, I forgot to put it here in the slide, but MOCA stands for Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Um, and it stands out as uh, one of the most widely uh, utilized screening tools for cognitive impairment. Um, it did gain fame when a former president discussed, uh, bragged about his performance on it um, uh, during a news interview. Um, and, uh, you know, what we'll see here is that most people without dementia uh, will be able to score a perfect score on this. So it's not saying much to say that, uh, that you aced it, but um, it is useful to, for detecting dementia. Um, so one meta-analytic study suggested a cutoff uh, score between 23 and 25. For context, the maximum score is 30. So if you score a perfect 30 on it, um, there's uh, no evidence of dementia. Um, in fact, anything over a score of 26 is considered normal. Um, and in a study where they used that cutoff, it was able to detect 90% of mild cognitive impairment cases. When they bumped down the cutoff score to 23, uh, it was uh, sensitive to 86.5% of cases, uh, and it was its specificity was near perfect with 
97.7% uh, specificity. Um, one thing that's unique about the MOCA is that it can be administered uh, on paper. Um, there's iPad versions, um, and uh, it can also be done via telehealth. Um, and telehealth actually became really popular during COVID. Um, so the bulk of normative data, hopefully this has changed, but at least when during COVID, the bulk of normative data was using the paper administration. So there was a little bit more margin for error with the telehealth one, um, but I do believe research is continuing, uh, which can make it feel easy. Usually um, primary care physicians uh, will give this um, once people reach the age of 65. Um, almost like they take your blood pressure uh, or give a PHQ-9, they'll give a MOCA so that they begin to have um, uh, a treatment history to measure cognitive decline. So the MOCA can be downloaded for free. Um, it has directions uh, on the download for how to administer it. Um, there are trainings available, um, and uh, I would suggest that you use them. Uh, when possible. Um, they're quite short because the measure is quite short, uh, but it does improve accuracy of the instrument when uh, we know some of the, the problems we can encounter when we just try to give it cold turkey. Um, another common screening tool is called the Folstein Mini Mental State Examination or the MMSE for short. Um, this is another one of the most common uh, screening tools for dementia. Um, it can be downloaded for free off the uh, internet um, and it's quite self-explanatory in the way uh, that, it is, that it is administered. Prior to the MOCA uh, coming out, MOCA came out in about 2005, but prior to the MOCA, um, the Folstein was the was the way that we took measurements of a person's cognitive decline. Um, it will provide you with a total score um, as well as subscores for different domains like attention, uh, recall of information, etc. Uh, similar to the MOCA, it also has a maximum score of 30. So if you score a perfect 30, there's no evidence of dementia. Uh, anything equal to or over 25 can indicate normal cognitive functioning. Um, my anecdotal experience is that most people will, uh, who do not have dementia, will score somewhere between 28 and 30. Um, some of the questions are easy to get wrong, like what county are you in? Not everybody knows where the county lines are. So sometimes people will miss a point or two, um, but uh, you know, scores of 25 or above are indicative. Uh, they recently did research on the domain scores, however, and found that they're not helpful. So if someone scores really low in attention um, or recall, it might not be best to make assumptions based off those domain scores. However, the total score um, is still helpful and predictive at in, uh, detecting impairment. So that's just something to be aware of. Uh, the last common screening tool that I'll talk about is called the AD8, the, Ascerta the Ascertain Dementia 8 scale. Um, it differs from the MOCA and the MMSE in that it's not a direct measure of cognitive performance. So with MOCA and MMSE, you're going to be having the patient or the client perform tasks and you're going to measure their performance, uh, those tasks. The ADA uh, utilizes self-report and informant reports. So it's a lot like a PHQ-9 in that it's essentially a symptom checklist. Um, the more symptoms you have, the more indicative of um, uh, dementia. So scores of zero or one are indicative of normal functioning. Uh, anything equal to or greater than two indicates that the person likely needs further testing. Um, one thing that's really cool about the AD8 is that it has an informant report form. Um, 
depending on the severity of symptoms or the amount of um, acceptance that the per that the client has reached about their dementia symptoms, uh, it can be helpful to administer to an informant. Um, usually this is a spouse or a child or a grandchild, someone who uh, observes this person throughout the day um, often can have vital information. Um, so you, uh, if possible, administering both a self-report and an informant report um, can be really helpful. Once again, the ADA is quite sensitive. It's able to detect about 84% of cases um, and it's quite specific. It can um, detect dementia specifically about 80% of the time, as opposed to something else like depression. So now I wanna move into referrals. <clears throat> so when suspecting a client uh, or when you are suspecting that a client may be in the early stages of dementia, um, therapists need to be considering at least three major referrals. So the first one is a neurologist, the second one is a psychologist, and the third one would be a family medicine doctor or primary care doctor. Um, the order that you make these referrals is going to vary based on factors like the test scores you get from screeners, uh, the client's preferences, and then also any parameters or barriers put there by managed care. So um, neurologists can provide um, specialized diagnostic assessments and neurological evaluations. Psychologists are gonna focus on the comprehensive cognitive assessments and psychotherapeutic support. Um, and then family medicine ph physicians can offer things like initial evaluations, coordination of care, um, and ongoing management of uh, any other health conditions. So I'll focus on neurologists first. Uh, knowing when to refer a client to a neurologist um, is crucial because neurologists are going to probably play the most prominent role in diagnosing dementia. So um, if you have a client and you administer one of these screeners and their test scores are in the moderate to severe range, um, those scores are severe enough to... Um, pretty well conclude that this person likely has some level of dementia. So in terms of diagnosing dementia, uh, more comprehensive psychological testing is unlikely to provide any further diagnostic value um, and could even delay treatment if the person's waiting to get in to do that. Um, I'm a psychologist, so I'm not dissing uh, psychological testing. That's what I do. Um, I'm just saying that if the disease is progressed enough it might be better for the client to refer them straight to a neurologist. So that's that's one thing, uh, high test scores. Um, neurological signs already being present. So if the person is losing consciousness, if they're having paralysis in different parts of their body, tingling, visual neglect, uh, clumsiness, these are things that are signs of neurological damage. Um, and that are very likely tied to any sort of cognitive decline they're experiencing. And so a neurologist would be the one to uh, help with that. So if a client asks, uh, a neurologist's examination is likely to involve a full physical and neurological examination. They may order diagnostic imaging like PET scans or CT scans. They may perform the lumbar puncture all of these things are going to be used to either uh, test for Alzheimer's, such as the lumbar puncture. Uh, diagnostic imaging can rule out other uh, causes of cognitive decline, like vascular dementia or uh, Lewy bodies or a tumor. Um, and even though a referral to a neurologist may be um, uh, the, the, the first thing to do, the neurologist may refer to a psychologist for baseline testing so that they can measure cognitive decline over time and also ascertain cognitive strengths and weaknesses. So in this way, uh, psychological testing is more helpful for guiding treatment than it is for diagnosing um, uh, 
moderate to severe dementia. By measuring those cognitive strengths and weaknesses, we can figure out where the person is going to need the most support. Um, so the next referral um, that you could make would be to a psychologist. I know I just talked about referring to a neurologist first, but if the screener scores are quite mild um, or if they are in the normal range, but the client continues to report clinically significant difficulty or distress related to their cognitive functioning, it's quite possible that they themselves are recognizing early signs of dementia um, and that, um, that they just haven't progressed to the point where uh, something like a screener uh, can detect it. Uh, so when this is the case, you could refer to a psychologist to do more comprehensive testing. Um, when I do these evaluations as a psychologist, the things that I am looking for, uh, I'll want to give an IQ test, um, which uh, for those who don't give IQ tests, oftentimes we think about how smart um, a person is. Really what we're talking about is information processing. Obviously that can help folks uh, throughout their education if we can process information, but IQ at its core is really just the processing um, of information. Um, in terms of neurologists, I'm looking at questions we're getting in the chat in Utah that I commonly refer clients to. Um, I don't have specific names, but I do. I will say that the U um, has a very advanced, very competent neurology department um, as a whole. So usually if the person's insurance is uh, compatible, I'll try to go for um, uh, I'll try to go for the, the you. Uh, another question we're getting is neuropsychologist versus neurologist for diagnosing. So um, the main difference between, uh, well, there's several differences between a neuropsychologist and a neurologist. Um, neurologists are MDs or DOs, they're physicians that have special training in uh, diseases of the nervous system. A neuropsychologist um, is someone who uh, is a psychologist, so usually a PsyD or a PhD, um, and they have special training in the relationship of brain and behavior. Um, so uh, a, an easy way to think about it is that neurologists deal with diseases that are related to the hardware of the brain, and the neuropsychologist measures the software of the brain. Um, oftentimes, the psychologists that you're referring to uh, in this slide will be neuropsychologists. Um, I, they may be board certified. Board certification is becoming more of a reality, um, but it's, uh, there's still a good amount of psychologists out there, such as myself, who are not board certified, um, but have adequate training to um, measure measure these things and provide helpful information to a neurologist. So uh, whether you're whether or not you refer to one or the other first is going to focus on those screening test scores. So if they're normal or mild, a uh, neuropsychologist has uh, tests that are sensitive enough to detect those things in the early stages that may not be caught by a screener. If the screener is in uh, moderate or severe range, um, we may not need that comprehensive testing to, to tell us that the person has dementia. It's likely that we can conclude that and send them right to a neurologist. So hopefully that kind of elucidates it a little bit. Um, if they do go to a neuropsychologist, they'll probably do some IQ testing, um, tests of executive functioning like the DCAPs. They measure word fluency, uh, disinhibition, a lot of the things that happen with um, uh, dementia. Uh, tests of memory, memory and learning are common. Um, so remembering lists of words, uh, remembering features of different um, photographs, um, really get at some of the uh, Alzheimer's specific symptoms. We'll also probably do some pretty in-depth clinical and collateral interviews. So the clinical interview being with the patient and then the collateral interview being with uh, a loved one. 
Um, this can serve a lot of the same purpose as the 88 uh, screener, um, but it may allow us to get more information since, a, since it's an interview um, and uh, it may allow us to maybe acquire a little bit more certainty. Um, it's also important for us to get a psychiatric assessment, so we may uh, get a lot of that information from a clinical interview, but we can also use personality testing um, to get a better idea of, I guess, the flavor of a person's uh, psychiatric concerns. Sometimes um, psychiatric disorders like depression can cause what we call pseudo-dementia, uh, which are essentially dementia symptoms that don't necessarily have um, any of the ideologies that we've already talked about. Um, it's often a lot more treatable. The dementia will often resolve completely with treatment of the depression. So that's another way it's different, but uh, we always want to check in on a person's psychiatric functioning. Um, after that, we may refer to a neurologist or a PCP based on results. So um, if I determine as a psychologist uh, that a person does meet criteria for um, like a possible Alzheimer's disease, then what I'm going to want to do is refer to a neurologist um, so that they can do things like diagnostic imaging or lumbar puncture to maybe get those biomarkers. Uh, hopefully my evaluation can provide a lot of insight into the symptoms, family history, and those types of things to kind of expedite the neurologist's uh, workflow. Uh, the last one's a family medicine or a PCP doctor. Um, when uh, clients require an insurance prior authorization for other providers, such as a neurologist, you may have to send them to a PCP first. Um, so it can be helpful for you to know, uh, if you take insurance, it can be helpful to know what the client's insurance is and whether or not they need a prior authorization. Um, especially if the symptoms are severe enough, you may need to either yourself or through the support of a loved one, uh, help the client remember uh, how to call insurance, get a prior authorization, um, or if they need to go into a PCP. Um, there also tends to be some risk factors associated with dementia that are commonly managed by uh, PCPs. So things like cardiovascular disease, thyroid dysfunction, I didn't put it in the slide, but diabetes is another one. Um, these are all things that will be managed by PCPs uh, even after a diagnosis occurs. Um, in terms of, I'm looking at questions here, uh, measures for unschooled people from other cultures who speak other languages. Um, I do believe the MOCA um, has uh, several versions. Um, Spanish and Chinese are the two that I'm certain of. Um, I do believe that they have German and French as well. Uh, so in terms of uh, cross-cultural measurement, um, the MOCA might be uh, a really good one. Um, in terms of people who do not have a master's level education or above, um, I would say that the ascertained dementia eight scale is probably the best one because um, it's focusing on the client's self-report. So there's no training really needed um, other than um, summing up those symptoms. Um, and um, I, I, I say this with uh, deference because I'm not sure. Um, I, there are trainings available for the MOCA. So um, I, I think someone who is unschooled could theoretically take the training um, and become competent in the MOCA. Although I would say that is probably the extent of their competency if they don't have a master's degree. Um, in terms of uh, another question we have is, do I know anything about allergy medicine causing dementia? Um, I actually do not know the answer to that question. Um, I guess theoretically, if uh, allergies are causing uh, if allergies or allergy medicine is causing something like encephalitis, like what we see in um, HIV, I guess theoretically that could uh, cause dementia, although I'm not aware of any research simply because I haven't looked. 
um, about allergy medicine specifically causing those things. So, um, so I'm not sure. Um, then the last one, and this is more for after a diagnosis has already been made, um, is an occupational therapist. So this can be helpful for maintaining and increasing a client's functional impairment after they've received uh, a diagnosis. So we've been through a lot of referrals, but I think it'd be helpful to, to kind of entertain the question of what do you do as a therapist? You've detected the dementia, um, you've made the referrals, um, what can you do? So uh, I think it's gonna be important to consider two factors. Obviously the mental health of your client, that is uh, obvious. Mental health of the caregivers is also going to be really important. So we have a lot of research that shows uh, one that uh, care, caregiver distress is quite common for folks with uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, just because their caregivers are watching the deterioration over time, they're grieving, and they're also having to provide sometimes twenty uh, like moment to moment uh, supervision of their loved one. Um, so making sure that their caregivers um, are uh, have enough support can increase um, the 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 happiness and quality of life of the client. Um, so in terms of the client's mental health, um, research on the efficacy of traditional psychotherapies like CBT, ACT, or psychodynamic uh, for individuals with dementia is still in its infancy. Um, even so, um, if we had very effective therapies, we would still be treating um, other symptoms. We wouldn't be treating the dementia specifically. Um, we would be treating depression that comes along, uh, maybe grief, anxiety about end of life care. Um, those are all things that are known to happen with dementia. And so we, uh, therapy is useful. Um, but in terms for uh, evidence base, most of the evidence base for um, psychotherapy is use, is normed on people who do not have dementia. Um, it's not completely absent though. Um, what we do know is that um, these types of evidence-based therapies can still be helpful, um, but they're gonna require accommodations. So um, sticking too closely to a protocol might prevent a client with dementia from accessing the therapeutic effects of the dementia. Um, so for example, a lot of um, therapies uh, require things like homework, um, it's going to be difficult for someone with dementia to remember to do the homework. And depending on the type of dementia, it may be hard for them, even if they do the homework, it may be hard for them to remember what they learned from the homework. Um, therapies like psychodynamic, which focus heavily on insight and understanding, um, may become less effective as the person's uh, mental status uh, deteriorates as well. Um, what we do know is that the efficacy of psychotherapy is inversely correlated with the severity of dementia. So it's going to be a lot more effective for people who are in the mild uh, stages of dementia uh, compared to people with severe dementia. Um, looking at the questions here, looks like there's clarification unschooled clients from uh, Congo, uh, refugees who are uneducated and only speak Swahili. I'm not um, entirely aware of the translations for uh, Congolese or Swahili. So um, that would be one that I would have to research. Um, and ah, someone was talking about Benadryl being uh, identified as a potential problem in increasing cognitive decline. So um, that's good to know. I'll have to research that. Maybe if I give this presentation in another setting, I'll include that. So I appreciate you uh, letting me know about that. Um, the, the last thing for this slide that I want to touch on is the difference between cognitive rehabilitation therapy and traditional psychotherapy. 
Um, so um, there's usually when we talk about, or at least when I say traditional psychotherapy, um, I'm talking about what most therapists do, CBT, ACT, psychodynamic, other theoretical orientations. Um, usually these are done to treat psychiatric disorders. Uh, with cognitive rehabilitation therapy, this is designed to um, uh, help a person either regain or maintain their cognitive abilities. So uh, their ability to um, learn, remember, um, oftentimes it's more of a symptom management, so things like keeping lists. Um, there are psychologists who do cognitive rehabilitation therapy. However, there's some crossover with occupational therapy. Um, and so um, my suggestion would be if you're a traditional psychotherapist, um, doing, re doing cognitive rehabilitation therapy may be something that uh, you should either get extra training in or refer to uh, either a psychologist who has that extra training or uh, an occupational therapist who has that training just by nature of their um, education. So getting another question. Uh, I've been told that FTD typically presents with significant behavioral changes, such as aggression or hypersexuality. You, needed, you noted uh, behavior changes, but I wonder if you could elaborate on this. Um, yeah, so uh, aggression, um, uh, definitely is something that can present with FTD. Again, you're essentially watching the person uh, lose the frontal lobe that they gained through um, childhood and adolescence. Um, it's behaviorally, they're going to regress to a much more uh, childlike state, and this can often involve um, uh, aggression. Hypersexuality, um, it, uh, that term is tough because like people do do things that are um, sexually inappropriate when they have FTD. It's unclear on whether or not their sex drive actually increases. Um, however, I'm aware of uh, one client who um, may have had FTD who routinely would expose himself um, and this was a person who never would have done that prior to um, contracting the dementia. Um, but because he didn't have the frontal lobe, uh, then behaviors like that who are, um, you know, may pop into our minds. <laughs> Not that it does very often, but uh, we, we don't have a way of inhibiting those. Um, and so people can do things that are sexually inappropriate. Um, the prevalence, someone's asking, what is the prevalence of FTD in, uh, new NCD cases? Um, I want to say it's the third most common. So, um, I would say about 10%, um, would be because we have, uh, Alzheimer's being 60 to 90%. Uh, we have vascular dementia being 20 to 30%. And so um, my guess would be 10 to 20% is uh, new FTD cases. Um, so yeah. So while we may not have um, a ton of research on like full-blown psychotherapeutic modalities to treat um, dementia, um, we do have some specific interventions that have strong research support uh, for their ability to maintain functioning um, and slow the rate of cognitive decline. So uh, mindfulness and meditation um, has been shown to reduce the rate of cognitive decline. Um, it can reduce the client's perceived stress related to the diagnosis. Uh, it can increase quality of life, and it's been shown to maintain functional brain connectivity, which is often uh, what we want in order to maintain, uh, like to get rid of dementia symptoms or to halt them. Um, so really any sort of therapy 
that is able to incorporate mindfulness and or meditation, um, I would say would be a better bet compared to therapies that do not do this. Um, music therapy is another one. Um, it uh, especially is nice because it can be applied to people across the spectrum, anywhere from mild neurocognitive disorder all the way to major neurocognitive disorder. Um, it, it improves the quality of life for clients. Um, it can protect against depression for clients, and it often includes the caregiver. So what this might look like would be uh, obviously listening to music, Often singing is uh, a, uh, a factor um, and it can be uh, therapeutic for the caregiver and the client to engage in it together. Um, for clients who are in the mild stages of uh, cognitive impairment, group therapy can be really helpful in um, processing grief um, related to the diagnosis. It can protect against depression for those clients, and it can also alleviate caregiver stress. Um, oftentimes what we see is that people who are, have a new diagnosis of dementia, they will tend to withdraw. Um, they will tend to, uh, because just like any tragedy in life, we don't always wanna talk about it with people. We don't always wanna tell people uh, because we don't wanna face the questions. Uh, or we don't want to have to answer the same questions over and over. And while these are valid feelings, uh, that can also cut us off from social support. Um, so being part of support groups or therapy groups that allow various uh, multiple people with mild cognitive impairment to get together and process that uh, with them can be really helpful. Um, Another question that we have is any suggestions on someone who lives alone and how to determine when they need a higher level of care, who would make that determination? Um, so <clears throat> usually um, for, for someone who lives alone, I think the, the big measurement is gonna be whether they can do activities of daily living. If they're getting lost, if they're not eating, uh, if they're having trouble with personal hygiene, if they're falling a lot, um, these might be signs that they need a higher level of care. Um, and that would involve more memory testing. Um, in terms of capacity uh, or mental capacity to make those decisions, um, usually that is a... Uh, any physician actually is able to do uh, a capacity assessment. Um, however, um, oftentimes um, doctors will call in the service of a consultation liaison um, psychiatrist um, to make that call. Um, they don't necessarily have to, but they do it for liability reasons. And obviously, I would want someone trained like a psychiatrist to do that too. Um, and so getting them in contact with the medical system um, is going to be important if capacity is uh, an issue. Um, because from a legal perspective, that's what's going to be required is the, uh, the signature of a physician. Um, so again, we have kind of a lack of randomized controlled trials for psychotherapy modalities. So, um, another place where we can be helpful and probably even more helpful than after a diagnosis is being aware of the prevention strategies. Um, so despite the fact that dementia in a lot of cases is highly, uh, genetic, um, it is possible to prevent dementia even uh, with certain levels of genetic loading. Um, so exercise is a very uh, well-researched, replicated intervention for dementia prevention. Um, this is for a couple reasons. Even Alzheimer's disease, so something that is not necessarily directly caused by cardiovascular health, 
it is correlated with cardiovascular health. So anything that improves cardiovascular health is going to defend not only against cardiovascular dementia, but also against um, Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia. So they found that even daily types of exercise that occur, you know, just in your daily life can be helpful. And they've done this with longitudinal studies that progress over 10 years. So um, they didn't do one specifically where taking the stairs was the only variable, um, but uh, they extrapolated the research and um, even simple habits like taking the stairs, taking a leisurely walk on a regular basis can be helpful in preventing dementia. Um, the, the more exercise a person does within reason uh, tends to be even more preventative. So um, I'm not encouraging people to be running marathons every day, um, but having a healthy exercise life um, can do wonders in preventing dementia. Um, another one is diet. Um, and uh, once again, this kind of loops back to cardiovascular health. We have high cholesterol, hypertension, uh, those types of things that can put us at risk for several different types of dementia. Um, two types of diets that are known to be helpful are um, a MIND diet, uh, which is a type of Mediterranean diet. Um, and uh, the reason for this is that, um, sorry, I got another question. I'll answer it in just a second. Uh, diet can be helpful um, because it includes a lot of uh, healthy fats, a lot of fiber, a lot of vitamins that are important. Um, and so this is why um, making sure that our diets are good um, can be uh, one way to prevent it. Another one is community, uh, social network. So um, the study that I cited here found that a poor social network, so uh, problems with uh, feeling connected to your community, friend groups, et cetera, made it 59% more likely to develop dementia. I included the stat there. RR stands for relative risk, meaning that if a person is exposed to something that causes an illness, in the context of this study, it was a poor social network. Uh, anything over one increases a person's risk. Um, and so uh, 1.59 being 59% more likely. Or social support, they differentiate between the two because social network is more like leisure time with friends. Social support is people with uh, caregivers, people who are able to provide meaningful help for activities of daily living. Uh, emotional support, uh, people without that uh, had a 28% more likely to develop dementia. So um, exercise, diet, and community are going to be three huge things um, that are important. And we can see that when we retire, um, if we don't retire well, uh, a lot of these things can kind of go down the toilet. If we're sedentary once we uh, retire, uh, we're losing out on exercise. Diet, not necessarily correlated with retirement per se, but also uh, if we don't have a social network outside of our work life um, or if we move somewhere and detach ourselves from uh, a social network, um, we can lose a sense of community. Um, and so that's really important. Um, Yes, so now I wanna move on to cross-cultural considerations. Oh, that's right, we had a question. So does exercise and diet help with slowing the progression of dementia? Yes, it does. Yeah, so even after a diagnosis, um, making sure that we continue to exercise uh, and eat a good diet will significantly slow the progression of the disease. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, in terms of disparities, um, the, I, I think it's best to frame the disparities of dementia um, in terms of what we just talked about in terms of prevention. 
Um, so intersectionality is always present, especially in the United States. Institutional racism, sexism, and heteronormativity play big roles. Um, and another one that you're going to see is a huge common factor that intersects with these is uh, socioeconomic status. Um, so for example, um, given the fact that um, people of color, sexual gender minorities and women are passed up for jobs or um, do not have as much access to the degrees needed to get those jobs, it can be more likely that um, they are working multiple jobs for long hours in order to make ends meet. It's compounded if they have children. So that means leisure activity is less accessible. Um, and a lot of folks use leisure activity to engage in exercise. Um, certain types of leisure activity may be either completely inaccessible or avoided for good reason. So for example, um, I lived in Missouri um, for seven years and I know there were um, I, my friends of color talked about rural Missouri being just a no-go zone. Um, you, if you're driving from one city to another, say Kansas City to St. Louis, you tried to do it uh, in one go. If you had to stop for gas or go to the bathroom, you found the largest town possible. Uh, so things like going hiking in the woods alone um, was not something that was a viable option. So. Um, due to societal racism, um, certain types of exercise um, are either inaccessible or avoided for good reason. Um, and if we're not able to get that type of exercise, um, it can put us at higher risk for, um, for dementia. So luckily there's a lot of movement out there on uh, hiking specifically, um, but I, I thought that was a good example. Um, Another one is diet. Again, this is highly correlated with both socioeconomic status and because of uh, institutional racism and white supremacy. Um, people of color have been um, unfairly affected by um, economic policy um, throughout the years. So um, this takes the form of the presence of food deserts uh, which can prevent individuals in low-income communities from accessing foods needed to prevent dementia. Um, so what this looks like is um, grocery stores setting up shop in uh, richer parts of town um, and neglecting parts of town that do not have as much income flow. This can make it difficult for people to get to a grocery store, so they need to rely on things like um, uh, convenience stores, bodegas, those types of things. Um, and that can make it difficult to have the type of diet that um, is suggested. Um, also as well, like sometimes certain types of foods are more expensive. Um, and so because of white supremacy being a core factor in American economic policy, um, people of color are going to face more obstacles in reaching uh, financial independence than their white counterparts. Um, preventative health care is another big one. Um, and so healthcare coverage is disproportionately denied to people of color. Um, so um, this was somewhat remedied, I say somewhat, by the Affordable Care Act in 2010, which did increase uh, the insured population by 20 million people. Um, a majority of those being people of color. Um, however, uh, different uh, interventions by um, Congress and the Supreme Court have made it easier for states to roll back their support of the Affordable Care Act, uh, predominantly in the South. So a lot of people of color have lost the insurance that they gained. Um, and so uh, this is yet another way that people of color are prevented from accessing health insurance. Um, racism from within the healthcare system, uh, both historical racism and contemporary racism, because it still exists, erodes the trust um, 
on the part of people of color, on the part of sexual gender minorities. Um, they, they might not want to see a provider. They may uh, avoid seeing a provider until um, things have gotten really bad um, because they tend not to be believed. They tend to be invalidated. Um, and this can make it difficult for them to uh, want to go to the doctor early on to get screened. Uh, another thing that's psychology specific is that psychological measures are predominantly normed on people of European descent. So the early detection of dementia um, with psychological tests can be difficult um, when uh, people of color, sexual gendered minorities have been left out of the normative studies that we use. Um, another place where uh, um, disparities exist are in women and LGBTQ individuals. Uh, again, SES is a huge factor here um, because um, a lot of healthcare facilities do not take uh, Medicare or Medicaid. Um, and so if that is the insurance a person is using um, or if the person is unemployed due to a physical illness or some sort of disability, it may be difficult for them to get into a healthcare facility. Um, there are healthcare facilities that provide free and low cost services, and they're routinely underfunded or harassed. So um, to risk being controversial, uh, Planned Parenthood, while it's often spoken of in conjunction with the topic of abortion, it actually provides a lot of other services that can be important for dementia prevention. So things like cholesterol screenings, STD testing, hypertension screenings, diabetes screenings, thyroid screenings. These are things that um, may be difficult for people to access um, that a community clinic like Planned Parenthood can um, provide. Um, they do provide them to men as well. Um, and so, uh, but because of, you know, Planned Parenthood's uh, mission statement, they um, can be safer places to go for women and LGBTQ individuals. Um, another thing, and this is more of a, a cohort thing, but due to the Reagan administration's neglect of the HIV AIDS crisis in the 80s, we're now seeing um, people in the LGD, LGBTQ community who have, uh, who contracted HIV, um, they're gonna be suffering a disproportionate amount of HIV related dementia. Um, and so these are some of the ways in which historical discrimination uh, and contemporary discrimination make it more difficult for um, marginalized communities to access the things needed to both prevent and detect um, dementia. Um, I thought I would give some suggestions on ways that you as the therapist can contribute to healthcare access. So the first one is taking time to research the healthcare disparities in the United States and provide yourself with as much education as you can. Um, as, as someone who's not from a marginalized community, I can say it's always helpful when folks um, provide their, uh, what they have learned. Um, at the same time, it's not their responsibility to. So we uh, you know, want to be able to provide ourselves with as much education as we can. Um, being willing to name the reality of institutional racism in the healthcare system and inquire and have discussions with your clients about their level of trust, I think is also really important. Um, oftentimes, uh, especially for people who look like me, uh, folks of color uh, may not uh, feel safe to mention. Um, and honestly, they are the ones who get to decide what their level of safety is. Um, that being said, naming it may be enough to help them feel safe enough to have those conversations with you. And if that's one of the big reasons why um, we are or why they're avoiding getting care, um, it's good to have that conversation. Um, knowing resources available in your community. Um, so um, I've kind of demonstrated that I may be lacking in this area. We've had several questions about who to refer to, and I'm, I'm, I don't 
necessarily know specific people. If we do know specific people whom we trust, um, that can be really good um, in kind of setting your clients at ease uh, with your recommendation. Um, providing psychoeducation um, is really important. Um, however, simply telling them what to do with the uh, information can be quite invalidating and even a reenactment of uh, racism or, or a different type of oppression. So providing the information is still important, um, but it's important to explore with your clients how they can use that knowledge in an empowering way. Uh, sometimes it's better for them to have the discussion uh, with people that they feel safer with, um, like family members. Um, so for questions from the audience, what is the difference between early onset dementia and late onset dementia? Um, there's two ways to answer this question, but firstly, it depends on the type of dementia. Secondly, it depends on if there is overlap um, or there is overlap with the concept of early onset Alzheimer's disease. So early onset dementia is a broader term. It's most commonly associated with early onset Alzheimer's disease and uh, FTD. Um, basically, we say the onset is early if it's less than 65 years old. In terms of early onset Alzheimer's disease specifically, um, 5 to 10% of new Alzheimer's disease cases are going to be prior to 65 years old. It's significantly genetics uh, that contribute to this, specifically Presilin 1 and 2 and those amyloid precursor proteins. Um, if there's mutations in those genes, then that means a child is going to have a 50% chance of inheriting the same mutation. So it can um, travel in families. Most people don't, I guess, I don't know what the word is, randomly contract early onset. Alzheimer's disease. Um, motivating a client to see a doctor for dementia screening when they're resistant to doing so. Um, it's going to be important for you as the therapist to determine what is the obstacles in an external one, like finances, fear of the providers, discrimination, misinformation. Uh, those are things that uh, are going to require different conversations than things like fear of finding out fear of losing denial or losing autonomy. Um, motivational interviewing um, is going to be extremely important here. So um, there, from a motivational interviewing perspective, um, the decision to uh, seek medical care for dementia is uh, going to be known as an approach avoidance situation. There's one choice, you either decide to seek medical care or you don't, um, and that choice has significant positive and negative um, uh, results associated with it. So uh, people may have what's called sustained talk. So this is time spent talking about reasons why they should not seek care. Um, it may be I'm busy, maybe when this other thing that I'm working on is over, these are things that are motivating them to not change. Um, enhancing change talk is going to be the name of the game here. So um, there's four types of change talk. Their desires, so their desire to remain independent uh, could be a way to motivate them. Their ability, so they fear like they don't know how to find a provider, um, helping them talk about ways to find that. Uh, reasons. Um, or logic, this could be uh, misinformation. If they feel like they have reason not to go, um, that may be useful to try and turn it in the other direction. And then need, they may feel like they don't need to go. Um, maybe their problems aren't as exacerbated as other people. So in this case, uh, using a screener um, to quantify for them in a number uh, may be really important. Um, so to conclude, um, there are measures available for use by clinicians who hold a master's degree or above, which can help screen clients for dementia-related symptoms. Um, dementia does mimic 
psychiatric disorders like anxiety, depression, OCD, and schizophrenia. Um, knowing the risk factors for dementia, their common presentations, and being aware of those precipitating factors can help you uh, spot dementia symptoms early. Um, and therapists, especially those working in primary care, are uniquely equipped to provide counseling on preventative measures like exercise, diet, and socialization. And then we also need to be aware of the disparities that exist based on race and ethnicity, sexuality, and gender. Um, I've included my references here. They'll be available in the PowerPoints. I did want to mention some of our upcoming continuing educations. Um, on April 12th, we'll have uh, breaking the silence about sex, how to talk to your clients about sex, sexual health, and sexual concerns. Uh, May 17th, we have one on ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. Um, and then we are also doing a peers training on June 5th for uh, certification on the social skills for neurodivergent young adults. Um, here's our contact information. If you're looking to maintain contact with us, uh, we would always love to hear from you. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to conclude the presentation. Um, and uh, I really thank you all for being here. Thank you.